So here's an email I received. Hope you and Sarah are both well. You being very quiet on podcast and social media. So I was basically just asking if you're okay. I'm assuming you've been busy. Bob. Uh, thank you, Bob. This was one of those emails that I went straight back to because clearly people were worrying. It had gone incredibly quiet. No, we're just very busy. I'm Paul, and this is the Mastering Portrait Photography Podcast. Sometimes life just gets away from you. It's just been incredibly, incredibly busy over the summer this year. More weddings than ever, more portrait shoots than ever. Uh, I think a mix of an opportunism. No, that's not the right word. A positivity, uh, a sense of optimism is the word I was struggling for. Having come out of the pandemic and also, of course, all of those weddings that have been postponed from the past couple of years. Everything seems to have rolled itself together and created in one of the hottest summers on record, the perfect storm. And I'm acutely aware that I haven't recorded a podcast for a while. Uh, I do apologise for that. It's just that with everything going on, we just haven't had time. And the podcast really is one of those. It, it's almost the perfect example of a creative's block. I, I don't really know what I'm... I don't know the right words for it, but I know what I'm trying to say, which is if you can't do it well, we won't do it at all. And sitting or finding time to sit and record a podcast in the midst of everything else, in the midst of everything else that's been going on, it just every time I've sat down to record on, and I must have recorded about three halves <laughs> or maybe four halves of podcasts in the Land Rover. But I just felt there was so many other things going on in my head that I just haven't finished one. So today, today is the beginning of the autumn. I stepped out last night, actually, and it was so beautiful out there. It was, it, admittedly, it was raining, but the air had cooled. And there's a certain smell, there's a certain smell that comes at this time of year. I think it's that sense of the leaves changing, the, the, there's a dampness in the air, slightly shorter days, Possibly one or two people have started to think about lighting fires. Uh, and there's a smell in the air that took me straight back to being a child in North Wales, where I grew up. And I absolutely love it. This I've said this year on year on year. This is my favourite time of year. Yes, all right, when it's hot and sunny and the weather it means you've got daylight from about eight o'clock in the morning. 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, up until 10 o'clock at night. Of course, that's absolutely beautiful. But there is certainly something about the light and the atmosphere that you get in the coming month or so, six weeks, my favourite time of year. So yes, it has been a little bit of a crazy one. There is too much going on uh, and there's simply on enough hours in the day to get through everything. And there certainly isn't enough time in this podcast to go through everything that's happening just at the moment. So forgive me if I kind of pick my way through a quick update. And then I wanted to talk about customer service and why it makes all the difference. I know, I know, I know that if I look back through, what is it 120 something podcasts, the one thing I talk about more than any other, even as a photographer, the one thing I talk about more than any other is customer service, the experience you give your clients. I will come back to that through the podcast. Um, some good news. I can't remember exactly where we are. So I'm going to just wrap all three together, all three of these announcements together. I think, obviously, I've spoken about the Panasonic Eneloop batteries. Thank you to those guys for asking me to be an ambassador and talk about their product. Um this podcast isn't sponsored by them. Obviously, the previous one was. But great, absolutely fantastic rechargeable batteries that we use throughout the studio here. We have also just been announced as Pixelu ambassadors. Now, if you're listening to this and you don't create albums in your uh, business or in your studio, 
a pixel it won't mean anything to you. But if, like me or like us, you create albums for your clients, then at the very least, you should be aware of Pixaloo. And Sarah and I have been announced as ambassadors for those guys. We have used their product, Smart Albums, probably, I'm guessing, seven, eight years. Uh, I, I had a bright idea. So go back a little bit. I've always been an Adobe user. I, I started out on Photoshop version one. I'm aware that that kind of <laughs> puts a date on my head, uh, but Photoshop version one, and I've worked with Adobe products ever since. But at the time that Photoshop came out, there's another package by a different company called Aldus. It's called PageMaker. And that was another product that I grew up using. So throughout its history, Aldus PageMaker was this brilliant piece of layout and desktop publishing software. And then eventually, as Photoshop grew and Adobe grew, they bought out various companies. They bought out Macromedia, who made Flash and Freehand, and they bought out Aldus, who made PageMaker. And what that did was it became InDesign. And so for me, InDesign has always been right at the heart of everything we've done, everything we've laid out, everything we've designed. Adobe InDesign has been at the heart of it. However, we realized that we're spending a very large amount of time doing the initial organizing and laying out of our albums using InDesign. And so we hunted around and found a couple of different packages that would help us with album design. And we picked Smart Albums by Pixaloo because it's incredibly quick, it's incredibly reliable, and it would allow us to export the designs we came up with into InDesign for the final tiny touches. The detail in this business is incredible and our designs are exactly like that. We go in at the very last bit to make sure that every image, for instance, is the right resolution. It hasn't been stretched accidentally. There's no rotations I need to worry about. We check that all of the edges of any images line up pixel perfect. All of these little tiny details are checked using a series of scripts and using the various sets of tests we run in InDesign. But it's such a time consuming process to put a design together in InDesign that we decided to run with smart albums to do 99% of the work. And we have never looked back. So can you imagine how pleased I am uh, when the guys asked us if we would be ambassadors for them? Of course we would, because we use the product. It's at the heart of our business. Um, there's more coming on that in future podcasts, future videos, and all sorts of other things. Again, they're not sponsoring this podcast. It's just that we use it all the time and they've asked us to be ambassadors. And in the same vein, we are ambassadors. I've already told you this one. Uh, we're ambassadors for Graphy Studio, who are simply the greatest album manufacturer on the planet. They're Italian. The albums are beautiful. The print quality is stunning. The customer service is incredible. I can't say enough good things about uh, this product or this company. And we've used those guys for a decade or more, probably more. They've been the product that we sell off the back of our weddings or to our wedding clients uh, and to our portrait clients as well. So these three companies, Panasonic, Eneloop Batteries, Pixaloo Smart Albums and Graphy Studio, they are the three that we're ambassadors for and I could not be more proud. And the lovely thing, of course, is that we're ambassadors for them because we already used them. And I think that's just rather lovely. Anyway, uh, August, well, August has been the busiest that I think I can remember. Uh, we had seven weddings <laughs> through August. Now, I don't do more than 25 weddings a year, full stop. So on average, we'll do two, maybe three weddings in a month. To do seven in what is already one of the busier months of the year just meant it was beyond. On top of that, we had a load of portrait shoots. Lots of reveals. I was judging for various organizations and still writing. I am still writing for N Photo and Professional Photo magazines. And I absolutely love all of it, but there was no space to fit in me sitting down for an hour with a microphone and then another hour going through making any edits and then another hour making sure that it all published correctly. There just wasn't the space to do it, which is. I can only apologise. I'm really sorry. I love the podcast. The podcast was just me and a microphone when it started. I just sit down and chat away. Well, to be fair, to be fair it's not that different now. Uh, however, it's one of those things that isn't our core business and the core business obviously had to take a priority. Also, if you're listening to this before 
September the 20th, 2022. I'm recording this on September the 14th, 2022. Uh, if you're listening to this before September the 20th, which is next Tuesday, Sarah and I will both be at the photography show. Uh, we were due to be there on Monday and Tuesday, but for obvious reasons, uh, the, the photography show isn't open on Monday as we all spend a little bit of time reflecting on the loss of our great queen. Uh, but we will be there on Tuesday. We'll be on both the BIPP, the British Institute of Professional Photographers, and the Graphy Studio stands. In fact, <laughs> I'm not certain uh, we're going to have a chance to be anywhere else other than the two stands. Probably uh, even lunch will be spent there. So if you head to one of those two, one of us or both of us will be there. Uh, we're talking on the Graphy Studio stand, but I don't know what time yet. We have no confirmation of that because, of course, everything's being rolled from having four days of talks to now three days of talks. So I'm not quite certain what time we're up, but we will be. So uh, you can catch us on either of those, either Graphy Studio or the BIPP. We look forward to seeing you there. OK, so sort of getting on to uh the topic i wanted to talk about but before that let me tell you a quick story so sarah and i went on holiday for a week took a week out we had to stay at a hotel called the pig on the beach which is right down on the cornish coast here in the uk it's a stunning venue beautiful food beautiful people beautiful wine on one of the days the weather wasn't particularly good in fact it was awful so we went for a walk, donned our waterproofs, headed over the cliff tops, and went for a walk along the coastline. Arrived in Padstow in the pouring rain and decided we would ring our son, Jake. The phone is balanced on the harbour wall. We've got it on speaker, chatting away. It's wet. The phone slides off. It bounces twice, hits the back of a set of rails for a ladder, which leads directly down into the ocean it slid down the back of the rail into the ocean it's high tide the sea is about three meters deep there and that's the end of the phone all jake heard from his end of the phone was dunk dunk bugger splash that was it phone goes dead so sarah and i were due to have dinner at the hotel that evening and instead we went back to the hotel and donned our bathing costumes under our clothes, headed back to the middle of Padstow to see if we could find the phone. Now, luckily, when we got there, the tide was now fully out. We knew where to look because it was at the bottom of the set of steps. And there it was. <laughs> there it was, buried in the mud, still working. In fact, had we had the sense, we probably could have used Find My iPhone and figured out the thing had come back online. Scooped up the phone, found a pub, washed it, so that there's only fresh water on it. Went and had pizza because it's too late now. We've cancelled our dinner. Went back to the hotel and decided to celebrate. We'd have the best bottle of wine we could find. It was a bottle from a region called Valpolicella in Italy. And it was absolutely stunning. We sat there and we decided we'd go and visit the region. So I'd like to say hello to Italy because Italy, you were wonderful. We've just come back from a week away, the Valpolicella region. Um, and what we did was we stayed at uh, a couple of different places. We headed to uh, Pisa, flew into Pisa, went to Siena, just a glorious city. This is Tuscany in the late summer, early autumn. I mean, there is nothing nicer. The weather was amazing the city, Siena, just beautiful. We stayed in a little castle with four towers on a hilltop two miles away from the city centre. You could see the city on a neighbouring hilltop over the olive groves in the distance. And then we travelled over to the southern edge of Lake Garda, Verona area, which was equally lovely, beautiful hotel. And then the Pièce de Résistance, Got to use a French term for an Italian holiday, of course, because I don't know. I don't know uh, what an Italian equivalent would be. Uh, we went and stayed at uh, a winery. And this was the whole purpose. The whole trip was built around this one night or this one day and one night in a winery. And the winery is called the Boglioni Winery. And I could not or we could not have had a better time. We were met by the most incredible people. 
Uh, there's a lovely guy called Lorenzo whose email says he's a wine specialist. Now, that's the coolest job in the world. A bit of context, we had hoped to go on a normal tour with this winery, but they had 28 Vietnamese wine importers staying with them that day, a late booking, which meant everything else got bumped. And so we were really disappointed because we'd built this whole trip around going to see this winery. So Sarah's emailing Lorenzo, Lorenzo's emailing Sarah, and they figured out that actually the Vietnamese party wasn't till late afternoon. And as long as we got there early, he would give us a personal tour. So we met him, we toured the winery, we saw all of the processes. And this is a, as a wine company who firmly believe in looking after the future of their kids and their kids' kids. So it's all organic. They have these beautiful processes that are non-impactful on the environment. Working with nature, they are letting olive groves fallow if there's not enough nutrients, there's not enough nitrates in the soil, for instance. All of the processes are natural. And they've even got these new concrete, um, I don't know what you call them, vats, I suppose, which are totally inert. They leave no flavor at all. Steel always leaves a slight flavor to the wine. Concrete apparently doesn't. Anyway, we went through all of this and we had a fantastic wine tasting with paired wines and food. And throughout this, Lorenzo could not have been more knowledgeable and more charming. I think he's actually their head of marketing. I know it says wine specialist, but my suspicion is he's head of marketing. If he isn't, he should be. Because everything he said made sense. So there were lots of little nuggets I came away with. I was scribbling, I say scribbling, typing on my phone, these little things. One of the things they said is they believe that, for instance, that they've borrowed the land from their children. What a lovely line. They've borrowed the land from their children. We tend to hear we've inherited it from our fathers or our parents. But he said, no, we've borrowed it from our children. And I think that's a smarter way of looking at it, because when you borrow something from your kids, you sure as hell want to give it back to them. Whereas I think when you've inherited something, there's not that sense. Now, this company didn't really start until 1993. And when they started out, nobody took them seriously. They would produced some incredible wine, but nobody would take them seriously because they kept saying, you're a young company. You don't know what you're on about. Um, you want to use all these new processes. We will buy it from you eventually, but we're not going to buy it from you until you're established. Well, you can't be established until you've sold because you need to sell stuff to keep going. And as photographers, I think we're aware of that. You have this thing where you start out. You might be brilliant, but you don't yet have any reputation. Well, the answer to the problem for these winemakers was to simply create their own wine bar. They had originally been a clothing manufacturer. So this was already a successful company. They knew what they were doing. And in one of their clothes shops, they simply said, right, we're going to no longer do clothes. We're going to turn it into a wine bar dedicated to this wine. It only sells their wine. Uh, it was in Verona, which is one of the cities we didn't get a chance to go and see. I think it's called the Liars Wine Bar. I think you can Google it. Um, anyway, that's how they started out. And it became one of the most successful wine bars in Verona. In so many ways, what they did was think laterally, how to market. But when I got chatting to Lorenzo about marketing, there's another winery. He said he'd seen them on Facebook. He'd seen them on Instagram. He'd seen them on Twitter. Everyone was talking about it. So he went across to try their wine. He said everything about the Twitter feed, Instagram, Facebook, social media was brilliant, vibrant, funny, lots of energy. So, but he tried the wine and it was average at best. But most people don't know that. He said, but the real, the real wine tasters do know that. He said, you can have as much marketing as you like, but you've got to back it up with a quality product again you can imagine me typing like fury this is really good uh, by the way i have already asked him and i've got to set it up i've asked uh, lorenzo to come and join me on the podcast <laughs> ideally i'll nip over to italy and record him face to face but i don't know if quite my budgets and timing are going to allow that hey i tell you what though what a great idea maybe i'll go do that uh, anyway he was right you can market all you like you can be popular on social media all you like but if you don't have a product to sell if you don't have a quality product to sell then really all you're doing is just making noise and have got nothing to back it up. These guys approached the puzzle of becoming a winemaker in really, really short time frame in the same way that a company like Brewdog did, the beer company. They just had a passion for wine, organic wine. 
They were going to create the best wine they could. They were going to use modern, I'm going to say modern processes, but that's not really true. A modern approach. So I'll give you an example. One of the things he said, sorry, this is talking about wine, but one of the things he said was that some of the tannins, the dryness you get in the Volpolicella region is due, particularly in the Amarone Classico wine, is you get a lot of tannin, which gives you a dryness in the mouth. You get a huge amount of tannin. And a lot of that tannin comes from the wooden barrels that they age it in. So what they've done is they got specially made huge barrels, absolutely incredibly big wooden, but barrels, because of course, for the surface area of wood to the volume of liquid, that ratio diminishes. So you get fewer tannins from the wood. So they have three sizes of barrel. They age all of the wine in these three sizes. And then at the very end for that year, they decide how much of each barrel to include in the blend. And that way they can control how tannin or how drying the wine is. Really simple idea, but very, very effective. So they got control of how they want the wine to taste. Seriously, one of the best bottles of wine I've ever had is their Amarone Classico. Just, if you get a chance, it's the Buglioni 2018 Amarone Classico. It's 2018 we were drinking. So that's four years old. Uh, it's a rich, dark, chocolatey wine. It's my kind of wine. I don't really have a subtle taste, but I, I like Guinness and red wine or dark ales and things because unlike Sarah, who's a super taster, I can't pick out the tiny flavours. So I like a wine that really is almost chewy, <laughs> almost chewy. Uh, and the Amarone Classico, uh, the Buglioni Am Amarone Classico is exactly that. That's not really the point. The point was that throughout this, he made our time there an event. And he also said that the Amarone, this wine I was drinking, that also should be something of an event. It's not a wine you can drink every day. It's a wine that you celebrate a child's birthday or someone leaving home or an engagement with. It's a very special, very special wine. And that rang true for me because as a business, we set about here wanting to make our photography a special event. It's not somewhere you come to every year for a passport photo or for a school photo for your kids. We're not. And we never set out to be. We set out to be somewhere you'd go when something truly special happened. And we've always stuck to that. And so for me, there's lots of really interesting similarities between their ethos and their mindset to ours. But more than any of that, more than any of that, Lorenzo could not have been more attentive and more funny. He made us feel truly like we were special guests of the winery. And yet I am sure this is something he does every day, twice a day, probably. And even when we were sitting having breakfast the next morning, having said goodbye to the 28 Vietnamese and popping them back in the coach, he came across and sat with us, had a cup of coffee and chatted away even more. We felt truly special. And there's an art in the end, I'm sitting here on a podcast talking about his brand, his wine. I was so completely fascinated by this approach where if he can make me feel special, I will become an advocate for him. And that's true of our businesses too. As photographers, that's our job is to make our clients our advocates, to treat them so well, give them stories to tell, give them experiences. Yes, the pictures, the, in the case of uh, our wine tasting, it was the wine. But actually what I'm talking about is the experience Lorenzo and his team gave us. I will go back happily. I'll go back to record a podcast, obviously. But the whole thing made us smile and made us a big fan of his wine. Now, there are so many wines out there, probably a thousand different types of Alpolicella uh, the Valpolicella region wine. I'm sure of it. But I will always hunt down his, even though in this country, they're a small winemaker. So in this country, it's not so easy to get hold of. There are only one or two websites sell it. I'll find it um, because I think that's what customer service is. It's creating a loyalty in your clients for your brand and for your products. Lorenzo and the guys could not have done a better job. And I think it's a really good example of marketing in the best form because it was genuine it was friendly it was easy to do actually all you've got to do is be nice have a great product and create a wonderful experience now as a footnote to this story we were flying back from venice 
So Sarah and I arrived at the airport reasonably early, a little bit later than we'd hoped, obviously because having sat chatting to Lorenzo, which is why we were there, we allowed ourselves to run a little bit late, got our bags into left luggage because EasyJet, it was too early to check in, asked the guys in left luggage, is two hours enough time to nip over to Venice? Yeah, he said 20 minutes, no problem. So we hopped on the water bus and we're sitting there quietly enjoying the, the kind of slightly chuggy rolling ride across the water. And then we looked at the timetable and realised the first stop was an hour. So we've got two hours to get into Venice and back out to the airport. And we're about to spend one hour of that on a boat. <laughs> Oops. And it's not a particularly interesting boat because uh, the windows are so high up, you can't actually see anything out of them anyway. This is really just a bus on the water. So we arrived at one part of Venice. We ran through Venice. Uh, that's as much of Venice as we saw to get to the water taxi point where we booked a taxi, hopped in the taxi, legged it back. The most expensive taxi in the world, by the way. Um, usually that's fine because it's an experience and it is an experience. But literally we had no time at all. When an hour and a half before the flight is due to leave, we're still on the water. <laughs> it was a little bit scary. Uh, I just about managed to get ourselves checked in and on the flight, which of course then meant we sat on the flight for 45 minutes because of bad weather. But that's by the by. So if you're ever in Venice, allow yourself more than two hours to get in and out from the airport. You're going to need it. Uh, so there we are. Uh, this uh, particular podcast all about customer service and the experience uh, back on air. And I do apologize again for the slight radio silence. Just we've been busy. I, I mean, it's really hard in the business when we're this busy. We've tried and tried to figure out ways of being less busy and we have throttled it down now. So with a little bit of luck, I'll find a bit more time to record podcasts to write for the magazines and do lots of things I really enjoy doing. My daughter was having a go at me over the weekend. Why don't we just employ someone? Why don't we just employ someone? And of course, we could employ another member of the team. But as you all know, as studios, to do that, I've got to ramp up our revenue because there's an overhead to employing someone. That's not that much of a problem. Um, but on top of that, we've got to find someone who doesn't upset the dynamics of our little team here. So Sarah, Michelle and I, I love this team. I love working in the studio every day. It makes me happy. And my biggest challenge actually is how do we do everything we need to do without changing the dynamics of the three of us? Uh, if I get an answer to that, of course, it will be a podcast. Hopefully, Hopefully you've enjoyed this podcast. Uh, if you have, please do leave us uh, five stars and a review. If you fancy it, that would be great. Please do mention it to a friend or to another photographer. You never know, they might enjoy it too. Uh, of course, also subscribe wherever it is that you are listening to this podcast. Uh, we're on iTunes, we're on Spotify, we're on Amazon, we're on all the big platforms. Uh, but wherever it is that you're listening to the podcast right now, just hit that subscribe button. And then as if by magic will appear in your ears uh, without you having to do anything at all. And whatever else, remember, be kind to yourself. Take care. 